I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome to day three. For those of you who have uh, tuned in for the last couple days and you came back again, I am humbled by that. It's been a great two days for me, at least. I've had an opportunity to speak to some very intelligent people. Of course, there are a lot of intelligent people on Wall Street. Some people might call them even clever. Uh, but some people here have, have had a tremendous process that they've explained. And today I get to get into one of the more, most experienced investors that have certainly uh, grazed into this pasture, which is uh, Mike Holland from Holland Co. You're chairman of Holland Co. You have so many titles, it's actually like if you go down the line, it, it'll take me too long. Uh, but trustee on boards, you're advising this, that, and the other. You've come a long way. Um, and I think- It's been a long time, Keith. <laughs> it's been a long time. It's 50 years, right? Yeah, 49, 50. not to overstate it. Yeah, and not many people have, 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 have done that. Yeah. And survival's kind of maybe a good spot to start. Like, you really have had to evolve throughout this entire period. Yeah. And a lot of us that are on the front end of it, I'm 20 years in and I feel like I'm just starting. And really a lot of people feel like in the last three to five years they've had to start all over again with yeah. the machine, factor exposures, how people deal with asset allocation. Um, but if you go all the way back, like 1968 JP Morgan, I think? Yeah, well I mean, done, yes. Uh, how long, I mean, I mean, that's obviously a long time ago, but, but, but how many things that you learned there still apply? Uh, there are some seminal things, Keith, that simply don't change. Uh, one of the things that um, is immutable is the things in the marketplace and in the economy always change. If history repeated itself, mm -hmm. all historians would be millionaires. That's a, that's a joke, but, it, but it's got a lot of truth to it. So sure. you have to continue to learn and be aware for the moment. The game conditions change, and so you have to change the process and the, and the tactics and the strategy as they change. So uh, one of the first things I did when I got to Wall Street was read the, the best things I could about, you know, obviously the Warren Buffett things, but also all the books. W one of the books that I uh, have stuck in my memory was The Battle for Investment Survival. Oh, wow. by, yes, by Gerald Loeb, and it was a great book. But I've always thought, yeah, you know, if you can just survive. I think Peter Drucker was someone who said uh, one time, the great management guru, uh, that, and you run this business here at, at Hedgeye, um, one of the ultimate tests of a management is survival. Mm. I mean, it bespeaks cash flow and all the other things we talk about. Uh, at the end of the day, if you survive and you, you, can, you can play the next game, that's the key. Mm -hmm. I mean, survivorship, actually, if you even look at public companies, uh, survivorship rates are very low. Right. You know, whether being acquired, you go bankrupt, the, the cycle just overcomes you. I mean, yes. think of, and, and, and I sometimes think about this when I think of some of these more story-oriented stocks, because these days everyone wants to hear a story. I think on Wall Street that's probably 50 years ago people wanted to hear a story too. <laughs> Always. Right? From yeah. a broker or whoever it might have been. Yeah. Um, but, you know, whether Elon Musk is successful or not, I mean, there are many railroad companies that were right that there was going to be uh, a worldwide network, there was going to be a global transportation hub network that was going to be put in place. Yeah. But those companies didn't survive. Correct. And so when, when, you, when you look at the panoply of companies that, that uh, didn't survive and then you look at the ones that did, there are very few of them. You have to figure out why did that happen. I, I listened yesterday to the Mark Chatan interview, yeah. and he was talking about Tesla. And he talked about the lithium companies. Yeah. They're still around. Yeah. And a lot of the railroad companies who aren't around were supplied by companies who are still around. Yeah, isn't that so, interesting? Yeah, so I mean, there are some obvious things. In yeah. there. It doesn't take huge insight or a huge IQ to figure out, looking at, at things that have succeeded, how to identify some of the success stories and to avoid the, the disasters. Mm -hmm. On the avoidance of disasters, yeah. like uh, what are there like any like, just clean cut rules that you always start with? It might maybe a BS factor. I don't know what it might be. With oh, management. for sure the BS factor. <laughs> yeah, for sure that one. And that doesn't mean that doesn't mean the avoidance of huge uh, uh, opinions of themselves when it comes to great companies. I think some of the great companies. Uh, hide their, their, their hubris, if you will, but they really are great. Goldman Sachs, Chatan's uh, uh, first uh, job yesterday as he was talking about it. Uh, Lloyd Blankfein is a friend of mine, he hides his hubris very well. Th those guys are really, they really know who they are and they mm -hmm. really are that good. And I presume the Boston, uh, you know, the New England Patriots probably are the same way or the Red Sox. They, yeah. they're, you know, they, they know actually are as good as they, they, they look. They really are as good and they don't talk about it, but they really yeah. have the confidence mm -hmm. and the confidence to continue to win and figure out ways when they're not winning to adapt back to your earlier question, to adapt to, when people don't adapt to change, 
they go out of business mm -hmm. yeah. or they lose the game. I mean, winners are hard to, to beat over time. I mean, that's a pretty yes. simple one. For, for those of you that don't know, uh, Mike Collin <laughs> was a boxer at Harvard and, and, and could have knocked you out in fairly short order. Uh, but, but winners, winners versus losers. Is, is it easy for you in life and in investment management space to pinpoint who is going to be a loser um, that is more, more of a fad or a short-term trick or somebody who got lucky. Is that easy for you or, or difficult? It's not easy, but you, over, the, over the decades, you, you begin to identify. Thing, one, one thing that I, I know is that if there is a company which has pretty much a single product which is enormously successful and all the kids want it, and the next Christmas, that's the toy that they can't buy. It's probably a short. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, and then you go from there. Yeah. So it, it's something that is, it looks as if it is not sustainable, yeah. which was what you guys were talking Again, about. Yesterday. You and Mark Chatan yesterday, yeah. <laughs> the unsustainability of some of these things. Some of the Amazon, as, as he pointed out, and as the great companies do, uh, actually create new markets. So yeah, the business they're in may not be sustainable at the growth rate it is, and the, de the growth rate is declining. Mm -hmm. But in fact, they're on to new businesses. Yeah. I've owned Amazon a long time, and I am just in awe of how they continue Amazing. to reinvent themselves. Yeah. Um, it, it's back to the sports analogy, which, which is that if something isn't working and it's starting to slow down, you better figure out what's going on. And that's halftime of the Super Bowl. You know, you guys are in the, in the locker room and they're trying to figure, you know, we're not doing very well. What can we do? No, exactly. We've got to do something different. It's the mark of a winner. I mean, you're constantly changing. That's Bill Belichick 101 right. for you people who are not Patriots fans. I guess that's too bad I am. <laughs> uh, and, and, and he always just says, hey, do your job. I teach it to 11-year-old kids that I coach. Yeah. I try to teach it to 41-year-olds that, <laughs> that I play with who are my peers here. Yeah. And anybody that's older or younger than me, it still right. applies. Like, right. we have to get up every day and we have to do our job. Right. Um, Question, just because you mentioned um, Mark's new new fund, uh, Growth Line, uh, more than a couple times. Um, you know, is that something that is unique, or is that just decorated all over the buy side? Because for people that are watching this in the last couple days, they may or may not be able to put that in context. I mean, you were the chairman of Solomon, you know, Solomon Brothers Asset Management. That's way back, right? Way back. That's in the 80s, I think? Paleolithic age. Okay. Paleolithic <laughs> You go to J.P. Morgan, Solomon Brothers, BlackRock. Like you've seen, you've Black seen Stone. Blackstone, Black yeah, Stone. yeah, for their funds business. And you've seen, yeah. so you've seen a lot Affinity of managers, Dome. thousands of managers' presentations. Right. So what so, I heard yesterday, that's right at the top. That's the real deal. Really? You talked about the BS factor. I've heard over my head. Um, the that one yesterday was about as. For anyone who didn't see it, go ahead and take a look at it, see what I'm talking about. And for those of you that didn't know, we're talking about growth investing, like how yeah. a growth manager yeah. legitimately thinks about companies that are on that S-curve. And he explained it beautifully and simply right. and humbly. Well, the humble part is interesting because in, in that presentation, not to focus on that, that firm, but the precepts and the, the concepts that he has in the process, the idea of, of saying, we can't see beyond three years. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of growth investors say, uh, we think for the next 10 years that we've got 7.5% real growth, and no one can see beyond three years. Mm -hmm. I mean, or, or, I, my experience is I've never met anyone Difficult. who can see beyond three <laughs> years, and, and, and could be wrong within the three years. But those, those ideas are, are a, a pre, pre, the, hum, the humble presentation was part of, part of what uh, mm -hmm. really appealed to me, because he, he would say what he didn't, couldn't do and didn't know. Yeah. I mean, that's I mean, on the buy side, the buy side will humble you yeah. big time. I, I mean, I, I struggle with this, and I mean, personally, I tell my wife this all the time. I tell people internally, how I am versus how I have to present the process aren't exactly the same exact thing. Like when you're presenting something, when you're singing a song, right? you can't just sing the song in a monotone voice with no costume and not, no bling. I mean, you actually, I struggle with that because... Because you know, when I go about my everyday life and how I deal with kids at a hockey rink or whatever it is that I'm doing in real life, right. I'm not yelling into a camera. Like, you know, but here with Hedge, I've had to almost try to evangelize this process. And in doing so, I think a lot of people probably call me, well, I, not probably, and I see all the names all the time. And I think they're actually accurate. You know, I could sound arrogant, I could sound cocky, I could sound overconfident, I could sound a lot of different things. But um, I struggle with that, I just, just, to, 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 just to put it on the table. Whereas when I was on the buy side, and nobody knew who I was, and that's pretty much the case with Mark Shatton. I mean, 22 years, all of a sudden, boom. You're like, who's this guy? Right. But you know what? This guy's had a great career. His firms know who he is, his investors know who he is, and he doesn't have to talk about it. But me, I'm stuck being you know, in this kind of commercialized I mean, zone. I, I'm yeah. actually going to disagree. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to disagree. I don't think 
you can get to where you've been in the business and survive by being someone other than who you are. So there is part of you that is the showman that has to be because you're in front of these cameras. Right. That's part of that's part of the when you when you're on the ice and they're telling you to play you want to play defense you you're used to playing up front and they say you do that you do that part of what you have to do here is make people interested if you if you're boring here if you're talking monotonal <laughs> and, and by the Marsha Tan wasn't boring but no. but but he was just presenting you're in charge here you have to do what you do. I used to uh, be on a show called uh, Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. One of the first, well, wasn't it the first show? The only show, the first and the only, and had eight to 10 million viewers because was, there was nothing else out there at the time. This again, back to the Paleolithic age in television. And, and he, <laughs> yeah, and, you gotta write that down. <laughs> and, and he, you know, we'd go out after uh, the show uh, with, with the guest, whoever it was, it'd be Peter Lynch or uh, uh, you know, a Warren Buffett type or something like that, and we'd just have a wonderful dinner. And uh, he would let his hair down, and, and he had a lot of hair, actually. And uh, he, he would, uh, so on the show, he had to do what he had to do be, in, to make it an eight to 10 million viewer show. Yeah. But he was true to himself. I mean, he never said anything. Mm -hmm. You would never say anything here. It's how you present it, because yeah. you have to present it in, a, not, in, in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I, I mean, but it still is, you know, like all human beings, we have a struggle, right? You know, the struggle to, I guess, to communicate succinctly a process, yeah. which if anything, that's what having to speak clearly in front of a camera has. I don't have, as you can see, I don't have a teleprompter or anything like that. If you and, don't do it the way you just described, succinctly and non-BS-wise, I'm going to turn it off, as are all the people watching right now. Right. You, you want to hear that stuff. Yeah. Well, how much has that changed? I mean, you, again, you, 50 years from Louis Rukeyser <laughs> to, and you've been on CNBC, Bloomberg TV, Fox TV. You might have the, rec the record, <laughs> if there's a record, for appearances. Yeah. Um, how much has the media changed you know, throughout, you know, again, you could take as long of a period as you want since you started with, how, how long ago was Rukeyser's show? Uh, 20, 20 plus years. Okay. Yeah. So how much has that changed? And is that... Uh, has that improved things for America or you know, the, the average Joe who's trying to get it, who's tapping into this media? Is it, has it stayed the same? Has it gotten worse? Like, what, like what, what, is this, what is this to you? The great thing about cable, Keith, is, is that you have so many possibilities right. of different things. And then, the, then all social media, what you're doing right here, people now can go back and look at that interview we talked about from yesterday. Exactly. And that's something my guess is some business school classes will probably grab. If mm -hmm. I were uh, Jeff Sonnenfeld at the Yale School of Management, I'd probably say, you know what, we're going to yeah, use part that. Of that, use that. Um, so you have all these possibilities. I think a lot of the stuff that uh, has been on for the last several years is entertainment, and it's really not helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot of things, that they have to fill up the day. So yeah. there's a lot of stuff. A, a very smart investor a long time ago said, uh, probably only two or three times a year, and you and I talked about this one of the last times I was here, only two or three times a year does a, a, a really good investment idea appear mm. or a great opportunity. And the rest of the year you have to avoid doing, but if you have 24-7 television, mm -hmm. cable television, you have to fill it up. So you're going to get a lot of junk. Yeah, so. yeah, that's what you end up with. Yeah. I mean, the last year the big call was, at least for me, it felt like was buying treasuries. I, I was looking at your... <laughs> oh, really? Uh, Did you get that right? <laughs> I was looking at your... But, but I'm looking at you know, your balance fund. It's like, yeah. you know, huge position. It's, it, it wasn't for everyone. And, for t and the way that I want to kind of bridge this is with that, what I affectionately call the old wall TV. Um, they've never taught people how to allocate their assets to treasuries, mm. never mind at the right time. Right. Yeah, is, that just a, is that just a fact uh, that's based on there's nobody that could be interested possibly in, 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 in advertising treasuries or nobody gets paid on that? Like, what nobody is gets paid on it. Yeah, that's exactly. The, many of the great ideas that I've seen over the years are ones that are labeled that way and, and identify themselves because no one gets paid. When the first inflation index treasuries came out, the so-called tips, yep. no one got paid to... 4% real yield, 4%, I'm sorry, you're, you're saying that you promised me for 20 years you're going to pay me 4% real. Um, stocks don't give quite that much real, you mm -hmm. know, you know, maybe five in, in, in a very long term. But treasuries give you like one or two, real estate is even, surprisingly, is even less than that. And then you add inflation on top of that. You say, well, what can, I, what, what, what can go wrong with those tips? Mm -hmm. How about deflation? Yep. Okay, the shrewd people in Washington said, we can fix that. We'll give you par no matter what you pay for it. So if you pay 99, we'll give you par if we have deflation. 
You say, I don't, this doesn't make sense. How could, <laughs> how could the deal be that good? Well, no one would tell you about it because no, no one got paid to tell you. And the same is true with, with diversification. People say, yeah, diversify your portfolio. That's boring. People turn, turn the knob. Yeah. Uh, so no one gets paid. It's not interesting. And but it's awesome. Yeah, it's actually oh, it actually awesome. works. Like now, yeah. I like I, I try to say that to, to our audience. I'm like, be happy that that's the case, because you, if everyone knew how to, to reallocate from, you know, a, a U.S. growth acceleration, which we had ten quarters in a row. Yeah. You guys can uh, pass that slide up on the deck again, uh, slide 57. I mean, this was an epic move that we just yeah. had in growth investing. Yes. And you know, eight quarters. Yeah, it's and then and then it was nine, and now it's good. You yeah, know, 10. ten. Like look at look at that in the context yeah. of. Um, I know. We'll have this. Uh, and, and treasuries, in, when growth is accelerating and we're in what we affectionately call quad two, yep. you sell them. Yeah. You buy tips. That's actually the point. Ray Dalio came up yep. with tips yes. as a plug for beating bond managers while they own duration. That was easy. Yeah. Inflation accelerates. <laughs> okay. Here's a security that I already have, Larry Summers. Right. Can we manifest this? It's, it's actually what happened, That's as exactly you know. I mean, and here's a security that I, I understand. Sometimes it's so easy I'm ashamed of myself. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, here it is. Right. Can we manifest this across asset allocations worldwide? I'm already the primary holder of these. I know how they work. And by the way, I buy them when uh, long bond investors are getting plowed. Because then my relative returns to the long bond guy just goes up. And yes. tips actually just don't go down as much. Yes. That's the point. That's from their, from their birth. Right. Yeah. So I, 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 this is part of a bigger question I wanted to ask you, because I think part of the problem, too, is I, I wrote my senior thesis at Yale on Warren Buffett and how I was saying this yesterday. Some people are like, can I see the thing? I'm like, definitely not. This is like, <laughs> you know, this is like me, you know, Canadian mucker. You're at, just a hockey player. Yeah, just like trying to write something. Um, Good choice, though. But I was always fascinated yeah. with investing and I always yeah. will be. But I mean, at a very young age. But my generation, for sure, and definitely the one before me, baby boomers, it's Warren Buffett. It's Graham and Dot. I worked for him, you know. You did? For Buffett and Graham? Solomon Brothers was taken over by Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Oh, at the time. And he you was were, my boss. When you were the chairman of Solomon Asset Management. Yeah. He was, awesome. a, cool, he was a cool boss. Yeah, cool boss. Right? He doesn't <laughs> even call. He did call one time. The, oh. first, time, the first time he was here, I got a call. This is, uh, you, you can turn off the television. Right? But, uh, he, I got a call and, and I was having a group meeting of the asset management group and the assistant comes and said, uh, Mr. Holland, uh, uh, Warren Buffett's on the phone. I said, yeah, right. I figure he's one of my friends who just read the, uh, the headlines. And so I went in and I picked up and said, hi, Warren. And he said, Mike. And I said, oh, shit. <laughs> It really was. It really it was. Really was yeah. And what, did you just want an update? It or? was actually something kind of uh, private with his family. and what, it, it didn't matter, but he, he wanted to speak to me about something that was, was important. Wow. And I got to know him and, and Charlie Munger a little bit. So it was See, my cool. eyes are like bugging out. And this is like the, this is the point. Like we, boomers and Gen X grew up with Buffett. That's how you invest. There's no treasury bond investment or asset allocation. Mm -hmm. Then it was Ray Dalio. And I actually put Dalio right, right yes. in, oh, yeah. you know, he's, he's actually, Dalio's your age. Yes. Dalio's he's in, really old. I think he's, <laughs> he's a young guy. Uh, you know, he's like 55. No, he's, yeah, the numbers are the numbers. <laughs> but Dalio, like Dalio really, again, when you think about him creating the tips market yeah. and institutionalizing it, yeah. like I wonder, you know, how the people that are watching this today, millennials and, and you know, people that are younger than millennials, I think they're called the... Um, uh, what are they called? The Homeland Generation? <laughs> Homelanders? My kids? I mean, like, is Jack McCullough, little 11 year old Jack McCullough, going to just do what Buffett did? Or is he going to think about, you know, fixed income and rotating within fixed income, rotating within his sectors and factor exposures, which came after Ray Dalio? Then it's now you're starting to talk about the multi strat hedge funds, Citadel, Ken Griffin, um, yep. et cetera. Yep. Like, is that part of the story, too, is that the places, and not to name names, but CNBC, are grounded still in Buffett? Like, they will, Becky Quick will bring him on, and thank God, and God willing, she'll continue to, because right. he's, he's, he's one of the greatest Americans in the history of, of, of Americans. Right. But what about everyone after that? Is it just going to take time and let's, space? Let's go directly, and we're going to use some sports analogies here as well. Let's go directly to Buffett. Over the long years, because when I was getting out of school myself, I read all this stuff. As I said earlier, um, you end up with some things that are maxims that he will live by. For example, don't ever let me buy an airline stock. I will never buy a technology stock. Things change. Bill Belichick will, will run the ball more when the pass isn't working. Warren Buffett, 
identifies that he can make some money in mm -hmm. airlines if he does it right. He lost a lot of money. The, his first foray said, uh, if anyone hears me talking about buying an airline stock, shoot me or something like that. Um, yep. And then things change. And so same thing to, with technology. You wouldn't buy a technology stock. Apple, Microsoft. So same thing. So when you when you look at who are the survivors and the successful people in the business, the Ray Dalios and Warren Buffetts, they all change. Things change and you have to identify those and then take advantage of the change or in, at the very least get out of the way of, of, of destruction if, mm -hmm. if it's going to hurt you. Do you, th do you think the next generation of investors, the millennials and younger, are going to think about their assets in terms of actual asset allocation, like what, what I talk about every day? Or do you think there's always going to be that endemic stronghold of you got to buy stocks, you got to pick the right stock? Boy, I, you know, the smart, I heard something, I heard so many things that, that have been helpful to me over the years, Keith, and one of them was, uh, so long as you, the analogy, the metaphor was, so long as you get inside the right church or temple or whatever it is, you don't have to be in the right pew. Hmm. You can be in the best pew in the wrong church and still lose a lot of money. You just lose less than other people. Same is true about stocks. Mm -hmm. When you are in stocks over 100 years, it's clear you should own them. But when I got into the business in the late 60s, early 70s, I got in at the tail end of, of an egregious, the right, look up the word, but egregious bull market in growth stocks called the Nifty 50. Yep. And was a, a victim, if you will, of, because I was a, the, the young guy on the desk and I was the one who was going to hear all this stuff from the, the clients who lost all the, the, for whom we lost all the money. Um, over the next 10 years, I learned a lot about the business, a lot about people, a lot about what a bear market is. Long, that bear market was, was synchronous, in, in a way, with the bull market we just had the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So people got used to, be, so a lot of people simply left the business. I mean, many, many people, my contemporaries, just left the business. How can you make any money in this business? Now we have people, as you say, who say, the only place to be is in stocks. Mm -hmm. Well, neither is true. You know, you, you, over a long period, just right. you, you have to read a little bit and then identify where are things changing and what, what makes sense. So my guess is that people who are wed, wedded to stocks only will, over the next couple of years, begin to question that assumption. Mm -hmm. I mean, it happens all the time. It, happens it just all the happens time. in big you know, periods of time. And that's the beauty of Wall Street, yes. is that every year or every generation, you bring in a whole new cattle class, or every cycle, rather, <laughs> of young uh, analysts, yeah. newbies who just want to learn. And depending on where you fall into your, your birth, birthing time, I suppose, on the street, is, is going to be your reality. I mean, yes. Howard Marks says it all the time. He's like, why am I such a good distressed investor? He and well, I started at the same time, actually. Same time. Yeah, he was at Citibank and I was at Morgan. So yeah. he looked at the other side of the uh, of, the, saw, of the stock bubble and said, "Okay, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna do distressed." Yes. What right. a good place to be. Yeah. Johnny yeah. on the spot, right at the perfect spot of the distress cycle. And just sold his company to a Canadian company. Yeah. I mean, have you? Uh, so, so there's another guy, Howard Marks, Warren Buffett. Who's the? Who's he's the right up there at the top. He's he's with those guys in terms of thought process. Who's the coolest one? Who's the coolest cat? If you could just go have one, you know, you only you'd be limited at one beer, Mike. Uh, <laughs> one beer, like with anybody that you've oh, met boy. that is older than me. I'm 44. You know, I've I've had a Forrest Gump life, and I, I've I've had I've been able to see most, if not all, of the the great names, and. Uh, the, one of the common threads is, is they're all pretty interesting guys. Yeah. And they wouldn't have been able to, part showman, part thinker, part doer, part executor of the thing, part being able to manage people. That's a real problem for, for some of the people I've known. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, uh, Buffett's right up there, needless to say. Uh, Howard Marks is really interesting. I, but, you know, I... Who would you say? You've met a lot of guys. Who would you say? Give me, give me a hint. Uh, I'd probably go with Wayne Gretzky. Go where the puck <laughs> is going. No, but go where the puck's it's going to guy. go <laughs> rather than yeah. where it's right now. He had, he had what you said Mark Chatton had yesterday, and Chatton's going to be cracking up if he's watching this because he's not Wayne Gretzky. Uh, but when we were <laughs> buying the Phoenix Coyotes, yeah. uh, Gretzky was an owner at that point of yeah. the uh, bankrupt, what was becoming a bankrupt entity. And uh, he was meeting with us in LA, like the new prospective yeah. investor group. And uh, he knocks on the uh, Four Seasons, we're at the Four Seasons, he knocks at the, at the door. I open the door, hotel room door, and he's yeah. like, 
Hi, I'm Wayne Gretzky. No. <laughs> yeah, I know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the guy. introduction. I mean, we're talking. I mean, he, but he was the coolest cat. Uh, so anyway, that's I'm, I'm uh, hockey on the mind. But he, he's all right. My, I'm going to give you a, a Yale-related hockey player among the cooler guys I've met. Not necessarily investment. Okay. Mike Richter. Oh, really? Mike Richter, the goalie. Yeah, met yeah. him at Madison Square Garden. Spent a little time with him and his sons. My wife was with me, and we were in an elevator, just stuck there. And he, he's he's pretty cool guy. Yeah, he's, yeah. Uh, there, there are a lot of, well, hockey players are cool. Right? If you're not a cool hockey player, you're definitely not a cool person. <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 and there are many hockey players that get put on that, that guy's a you-know-what. Yeah. Like, it's really easy to separate who is yeah. cool and non-cool yeah. in hockey. Sports. Anyway, uh, let's, let's, get to, <laughs> let's get to some... Um, How about stocks? Your, uh, yeah, you got any, got any names for me? Yeah, you, well, you have, um, by the way, you have, um, you have a lot of questions rolling in. So if you have more questions for Mike on any topic, as you know, he spans... Uh, 50 years here, so you okay, can get so a lot I'm, of Okay, so I'm going to volunteer a name. I didn't, you know, I would usually say, I don't want to talk about specific names, but I'm actually going to get, reading your recent stuff, Quadrant 4 and Quadrant 3, uh, reading about gold and energy and uh, treasury. Uh, Exxon, this is Occam's razor, Exxon yields 4%. I don't have to know any more than that. That's it. It's an energy stock, quad three, energy stocks work, and it yields 4%. Yeah, and if you think rates are going down, 4% mm -hmm. probably is an attractive yield to grab onto. Really good. So it just, it just pass that along. We, we're going to have a... That's my Apple. Remember we were oh, here you. several years ago, that was Apple? Yep. And Exxon has a sneaky way of becoming one of the top market caps all of the time. <laughs> You know, it's in, and it's currently not. You know, it's not. Um, we, last year, you had a couple trillion dollar companies that subsequently became less than a trillion in fairly short order, and then everybody said, "Okay, we're all good again." Um, getting it's, also, a lot of it's also a hedge on uh, people talk about geopolitics, and I, it's a waste of time to talk about whether Donald Trump should be doing this, the Chinese should be doing that. The fact is, things are a little bit uh, astir. It's possible that oil prices, if some things go wrong, will be higher than they are now, and if they are. Exxon goes up. Yeah, you get the ge that's actually a real po important point. It's a that nobody's on the geopolitics. How many people today are positioned for geopolitical risk? Yeah. Zero. Yeah. They're positioned for the upside. And, yeah. and actually, you get a lot of questions because you've spent, I don't know how many times you've been to China, but more times than most people. Many, many, many. Many. Starting back, starting back in the 90s. You're the the 90s, 90s was the first yeah. time you went? I went there in 1991. Yeah. To uh, what part of China? Was the, like, All over China. I mean, yep. started back then, you, you simply went to Beijing. You started, you, you landed in Hanoi, I mean Hanoi. You landed in Hong Kong. You went to uh, Beijing, you went to Shanghai. Yep. And after that, we started doing Shenzhen and go all over the country. Mm -hmm. We invested private and public, you know, the China fund for, did really well. Yep. And lost a lot of money when we were defrauded, which we were periodically. We had a Canadian real estate developer go in with us, uh, knew all the right people. It was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal years ago, one of the great frauds of all time. It was a golf-related uh, expat community. Uh, that was a private investment. Uh, we, we did some other investing that was private. And we just went you know, 10 times our money. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, the risk reward is, is, is yeah, what it is. You have to be prepared. Well, you have, you have a lot of questions on China and, I, and also on the Fed, but on China specifically. And what I was going to say is people are positioned for geopolitical risks. They're positioned for yeah. what everyone's long a call option, but they're not quite sure what that is. <laughs> right. It's more cowbell, which we've had three <laughs> times now. So now we're on, yeah. I call it triple dovish today. But I mean, three cowbells, but you notice how like the third cowbell didn't work out like the first cowbell. <laughs> um, and the other one is that bad we're Bad news may be bad news. Yeah, well, I don't like that's this is what I want to ask you. Like the uh, this alleged China deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard every adjective to describe it from our president, uh, mm -hmm. and and I don't know what it's going to be. Yeah. Like, do you think of that as a call option or a potential put? Uh, n neither. I think it. I think both guys. And this is a real a mano a mano thing with these two guys. They both need a deal of some kind, uh, whether it happens in June. May, April, mm -hmm. uh, or six months from now, the markets will have their reaction. But each of these guys needs a deal for his own political life. Mm. And in the case of Mr. Xi in China, maybe literally his life. Because when they have revolutions there, the guys in charge get killed. So he doesn't want that. So he wants his economy to do well. It's slowing down now, like the U.S. is slowing down. The rate of growth is declining. Not going to zeros, not going to recession. Right. But he has to create jobs. When he doesn't create jobs, People get really restless, and they've, they have a history of, of doing things that get rid of the leaders. So he wants to preserve the Communist Party. He wants to preserve wealth creation so that he can stay in his job. Mm -hmm. we, we know why Trump has to get a deal. So would you, like, that existential, I mean, a lot of people would say don't, in, in that regard, they'd probably reduce it to don't fight Trump, don't fight the Fed, and don't fight G. 
I mean, Xi, as you know, came, you know, guy lived in a cave before he became politically <laughs> really, popular. Really tough guy. Uh, he, he's had a long road he's a and tough he's guy. committed and yeah. he's got his constituency, but he's yeah. also got that rattling within the party now. Right. Like, yeah. d does, is, is the fact that it is an existential threat for him, quite literally, when you become king, you are going to be beheaded at some point or yeah. some, something yeah. unfortunate. Is, is it being exis existential make it a call option? Because he has to get it done, therefore? No, because the, the nature of it, what it is that he gets accomplished or Trump gets accomplished may be far less than anyone wants right now. That's the point. So that's, they will get something at some point. Uh, Trump today has, has talked about he wants to continue to do the tariffs. I mean, th these are all games that, that are being played on the, on the one hand. On the other hand, you have some crazy people behind the scenes, you know, Peter Navarro and people like that who, who you know, so bad things can happen. I think the, the probability of those bad things, meaning no deal uh, happening, is pretty low, it's possible. Mm -hmm. all, one of the things for survival in, in the investment business is you never say, I know nothing can happen or I know something will happen. Mm -hmm. There's, there are possibilities, that, so you prepare for the small probability there will be no right. deal, which means you probably own, own a lot of the things you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty good place to be. So if you have the deal that's not the greatest deal ever, which it's been effectively described, it, it's gonna be great. I mean, there's no other not way to great. describe it. Can't um, be great. But that's, that's, that's how people are positioned. The, the two guys can't win. Mm -hmm. They can win a little bit. Yeah, they both. Go, yeah, they can't, can't both, both win. win at the same time. It isn't going to. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Neither, neither guy. Yeah, on on Trump, like a lot a lot of people have made a lot of mistakes. If if you're a Trump hater or you're a political lover, um, I'm neither. I just gen, gen, I said this yesterday. I'd say it to anybody. I just genuinely don't like or associate with politicians. I've never actually <laughs> voted once in my life. Uh, if you think that's not patriotic, it's fine. I'm Canadian anyway, so <laughs> there's a reason for that. But I mean, I, I don't like, right. like, I mean, some people truly have invested with their political view since Trump has been elected, and that couldn't that's have crazy. been more wrong. That's crazy. Yeah, I, I think one of the things you have to do, remember Mr. Spock in Star Trek? <laughs> that's how you have to approach the markets. And it took me a long time. I, I made lots of mistakes by being emotional in the early years. I was a kid in the business. And... Uh, you have to extract, to the extent that you can, extract emotions and ego. From, it would have been very easy for Warren Buffett to say years ago, you know, I said out in public, very publicly, that I would never buy uh, a technology stock. But boy, look at that Apple at eight times earnings. That's really stupid. And, <laughs> and Microsoft at 12 times. I mean, this is, and, 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 and the cash flow from, from this airline. and so. I, I think when you when you take the emotion and ego out of investing, you really are way ahead of the game. Yep. Most people don't do that. It's really hard for people. Yeah, uh, the really guy hard. yesterday, back to him. Yeah, no, Mark e Shad, no, no, no ego, and and that's why he. Is, and same with Dalio, Buffett, uh, you know, all all of these people. Mm -hmm. They they step back and say, okay, what what can I do to make some money today? And how yeah. can I avoid losing it? Now times? there's one institution or a series of people that work at an institution and have across your 50 years that doesn't fit that bill, the Fed. <laughs> how, like, and, and since we have yeah. so many questions on the Fed, like how, is, how, how, how have you lived through this, this, this Federal Reserve's manifestation to, the, the, I'd say the most hubris you could possibly have, to bend the oceans, um, you know, smooth the skies, yeah. however you're going to do yeah. it. They fundamentally believe that how they do it is the only way to do it, that their forecasts are actually accurate when 74% of the time they're wrong. Like, how have you dealt with the Fed just mentally <laughs> well, for 50 years? Once again, getting dispassionate about it. In the early years, I, I could get, you know, a little irate about, you know, the, the hubris and, and, uh, and the mistakes and, mm -hmm. the, and the lack of acknowledging we made a mistake mm -hmm. uh, and doing, with the benefit of hindsight, really stupid things. Like if you really want to hurt the U.S. economy, here's what you do. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the uh, you know, Taylor rule, the, the Phillips curve, all, you know, the, all, and I, I confess some of my good friends are economists mm -hmm. and, and I still like them. But they're, you know, it, it, it's a profession that has very little in the way of saying I'm sorry and very much in the way of being wrong by history, by facts. And so what I, well, how I've I, I identified how I should do is pay as little attention to them as I can other than acknowledging they're probably a lagging indicator yep. at best, mm -hmm. a coincident indicator, which is maybe what Powell has taken them to yesterday, mm -hmm. and never a leading indicator. Mm -hmm. They simply aren't. Mm -hmm. and, and, and beware at the time when uh, uh, an Alan Greenspan becomes anointed because you're about to lose some money. 
because <laughs> the Fed cannot lead things. Yeah. They can't. Well, that's the scary part about Powell is that, uh, one, like you said, he pulled forward with two quick rate, you know, two quick dovish moves right, right after a rate hike. Yeah. Janet Yellen would not have done that, as you know. Right. She would have been all academic about it. She would have you know, been squirreled up in her labor you know, economics textbooks and said, yeah. wow, this is a super late cycle yeah. labor inflation. I can't be, I got to keep raising rates. So you got, you got to give the guy com credit for being commercial. Yes. If only because he came from private equity and he's a lawyer and he effectively said, okay, credit stopped trading. I got to get this transmission mechanism that the Fed created to start flowing again. That's as positive a view as you can possibly have of the Fed, which yep. you just described. And he That's did it good. quickly. And he did it. And then all of a sudden yesterday, he triples down on it, drops the dots and say, forget rate hikes. We're not doing them anymore. Right. But now what? Oh yeah, what now? Yeah, now, you, you've seen this every time. Not everybody that's watching this yeah. has lived and traded through it. Most yeah. people, you know, and I don't know if they take my word for it, but it's just history. I mean, the Fed always goes from hawkish to dovish. The first you know, the knee-jerk reaction is buy stocks, and then you make a lower high, and then the economy, if it's slowing, and they're going dovish because the economy is slowing, and it is actually coincident, to your yes. point now, yes. he wasn't lying when he said the economic data has been slowing. That's a fact. But, they're, they're, then they're, they're the stock market stubborn. starts to go down again, and, right. and credit spreads start to widen. So why would that be different this time? <laughs> Those are the dangerous words, it's, 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 this time it's different? Right. <laughs> no, no, it's not different. And, and, and I think, I think it, it gets back to our previous discussion about the process of, of picking investments, not just stocks, but picking investments. When you step back and you're dispassionate about it, and you say, okay, here's, here's a piece of paper that I can buy on its own, without any of this other noise, this Brownian motion out here. Uh, that was good, wasn't it? Yeah, that was very uh, good. <laughs> uh, is this something I, I, I should consider owning? And, and if the answer is yes, then you do a little more work. So I, I think it's most important at times like this, when you, you, the, the, it looks like the, the tide is beginning to change. So the water was coming in, now it's starting, it's right here. And I think it's, it's a dangerous time in terms of losing money. If this is, by the way, using Brownian motion, you just dropped that on me. Uh, for the record, Mr. Holland went to Harvard, not Yale, and he did not, like I had, the lowest SAT, SAT score at Yale. He actually uh, also got his MBA in finance from Columbia. So you, uh, you're, Warren an, you're Warren an English Buffett major school. in 1966? Yeah, yeah, I know wow. how to read books. <laughs> I read a lot of books. All right, let's go. You want to take some questions? Absolutely. Uh, cool, that's awesome. The, uh, yeah, let's okay. go for the attack people first. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, he's, he, get, I got, get a nasty I one. got questions about Wayne Gretzky. Um, so where the puck is going, not where it is. Uh, question. Question for Mike. Is China overestimated a repeat of Japan when you were watching it and living through it in the 1980s? Wow. That's a, such a good question. Because you lived through it? Yeah. And I used to You're spend a lot of time in Japan yeah. before I spent a lot of time in China. Very, very different cultures. Historically, for people who read books, go back and look at the history of China. For people who read books. <laughs> not, not as thank many you, people read books. Thank you for that, picking that. <laughs> uh, China's mercantile success rate, their percentage success, how many games they won over the, they are really way up there. Japan, not so much. Japan's culture was not one that was sustainable mm -hmm. the way they were doing it. I'd go over there and you, you'd see things and end of the story, the Chinese are an adversary for number one the likes of which Japan never was. People were worried in the 80s about Japan Inc. taking mm -hmm. over the world. But when you went there and you w were with their business people, it's like, this doesn't make a lot of sense. And I could go through the specifics. The, the Chinese are different. Yeah. They, they're, they're, they're really, really good. They mm -hmm. buy low and sell high. How is that? Just yep. Occam's razor. I mean, they, the way that these guys stimulated in 2016 into what I would 2008, call- 2008, 14% GDP investment yeah. in the economy. Yeah, they know exactly what they to do. They know what to do. And this time around, I said, yeah. it's not so bad. We're going to do 6 to 8%. Yeah. This, they're really smart. Well, there's actually one of the better history books, um, you know, more of a geopolitical risk book, which I think if you're right on geopolitical risk becoming a bigger issue, uh, it's a, the Harvard professor wrote it and talks about Thucydides' trap, or if you look at the rising power versus the existing power. And at this point in the U.S., and I think he, he, he shows every single one that mattered, they don't all end in war, but a lot of them do. Right. And now you have China's the rising power and you have the existing power of the U.S. Right. China's going to eclipse the U.S. in GDP by 2023, 2024, 2025. Right. Their plan is for 2025. And they're playing to win. Right? This yes. is not Japan. Yes. And they look out 100 years. Right. Japan, what, the same predictions were made about Japan. They would take over the world within you know, two decades. Right. And 
It was hard to see when you were there. It's not hard to see when you go to China today or were there five years ago or 10 years ago yeah. or 20 years ago because they continue to reinvent themselves. When they see a mistake, they, when they open their markets, Keith, um, in Shanghai Exchange, all stuff, they, 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 were, they were criticized uh, by a lot of people. Jim Chano's good friend and a Yale graduate, uh, you know, the mistakes they were making with the markets. They, they righted them immediately. Mm -hmm. They said these, these, um, uh, these rules we have for closing down markets when the markets get volatile, we're going to get rid of them. They don't work. And they, they just know how to do things better. Mm. It's, it's, um, so you would say that they're underestimated. The question long was, term, are they Long term. Yeah. But the question about are they slowing down today, which is really the question within the question, they're absolutely slowing down right now. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, too, they're, they're too big now. When I first went over there, there was still... Uh, uh, primarily bicycles in the streets, not cars. Mm -hmm. And they're big now, number mm -hmm. two, and they're, they're going to be number one. Yeah, I started in the early 2000s going over there to do just my own, like I was at a hedge fund, I'm an analyst, so I'm the one who gets shipped over there to do right. my research. And it's <laughs> a lot of bikes, a lot of pigs. Uh, it was, uh, <laughs> I was like, wow, this is, uh, I thought northern Ontario was a little backwater. This is, uh, this this is, is rural. Different. Yeah, at, at least up there we had guns and ATVs. Um, <laughs> What is Mike's, I don't know if you have a view on this, actually, that's why I want to ask the question, too. Um, what is Mike's current view on gold stocks, and, and have you liked them historically? Some of my best friends are gold investors, um, and I told a couple of them, uh, a guy named David Hathaway, I don't know if you ever mm -hmm. read it, uh, one of the great gold investors, and I saw him shortly after, years ago, people had gotten excited about gold, and I said, David, I, there are two things that I can do. I, I can um, buy um, I can go short, I can short something, or I can buy gold. And either one of those is going to be a money loser. I mean, I, I can't short to, to grow hair. Um, and I can't buy gold stocks. To me. So I top ticked, I, I bought the GLD, and I told him, I said, you probably the rest of your life will never see gold at this price again. Yeah. It's just going down from here, and it's never gone back to that. So I think I defer to people like you because you're saying that inflation is going down yep. and gold is going to go up mm -hmm. and treasury prices are going to go up. Mm -hmm. And I have enough humility to say I know a history of gold being related to inflation, but if you think, and then I, but I also know that the, the, the spirit of the markets would identify that's probably the right course mm -hmm. because people don't want to buy gold today the way they did back when and I started. I mean, it partly has to do with the Bitcoin mania, people that just don't, you know, a lot of libertarians, right. a lot of people that don't believe right. in government, they right. hate fiat currencies. There's a lot of reasons to agree with that. Right. Um, but they just, you know, they, they overloaded on their Bitcoin exposures and right. underweight global positioning right. in gold has never been, I mean, coming into now about, it's starting to climb. It's not about inflation. Right. It's about other things. So right. people who are smarter and more adept at doing this stuff, yep. um, uh, that's I would defer. Yep. You know who's uh, adept at it? Uh, uh, the people you just mentioned, the Chinese. Oh, Nobody's yes. taken yes. more physical delivery on gold. You know, people are bu buying GLD is one thing. You know, my me buying my wife. You know, this uh, from this company a company called Mene, which you should check out. They mark to market basically any piece of jewelry you buy in gold with a ten percent markup against okay. you know, the actual gold price. So yeah. your wife, like in my case, she's her jewelry is is trading in real time, so she could lose that, <laughs> especially if I go bearish on gold. Um, so some people know that I've, you know that's a company that I've been interested in expressing the way that I do it: physical gold, gold miners. You know, but the actual physical delivery of gold. Yeah. Um, the Chinese on the Shanghai Exchange are just taking gobs of it. Yeah. yeah, you take the other side of the trade with the Chinese at your peril. You don't want to be on the other side of a trade with the Chinese. If, if they're buying gold, I'm going to tell you, you probably should be buying gold. Yeah, they're not buying GLD. They're, buy, they're taking... No, no, gold, physical yeah. gold. And actually that side's on, you know, again, if you go all the way, I was citing this book this morning, and she's probably one of your friends too, Doris Kern, yes. good ones. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's like, if you go all the way back the great across history, and you look at the manifestation of both financial and military power in the world, it always ends with that you know, that global power getting the most gold. <laughs> you confiscate it yeah. from those that yeah. you're, you know, uh, you know, confiscating from. Right. And, and, and the Chinese, they're building their position. Yeah, when the Eng English uh, uh, moved away from their position in gold, the U.S. took over. You know, that was the, yep. end. That was the end of the empire. Bingo, exactly. Yeah. Um, what do you, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you, you know how to, uh, to go with this one. Um, what did you think of the economy of the Ming Dynasty? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> robust. Robust, robust economy. Yeah. You know, uh, this is good porcelains. As as someone as someone that studied civil engineering that wants to break into the field of investing as a career, uh, what early tips would you give me, Mike? I've been paper trading, but it seems like nobody takes a look at my resume because of my work experience in engineering. <laughs> so I need to get good at this. Well, engineering, I think, is a, a, a really good background for yeah. for you know you talk about process Great. as you were yesterday. I think uh, the the problem is he has to find a mentor. He has to find someone who's really good, a Sig Sigalis, if you will, who uh, Warren Buffett. I mean, you can't get a job with Warren Buffett, but join join a smaller, or large group where he, he can be mentored by smart people. Mm -hmm. Getting in the door is a big thing. You have thing to get people. in the door. Yeah. yeah. And it's uh, and if you can't, it's a tough thing. I mean that's yeah. Yeah. I was I was lucky enough. That's the I guess that's the beauty of, of being a hockey player. Yeah. Uh, is that you know, you, you have those connections and I was right. lucky enough uh, to get my first so show. So call Keith, he'll get you connected. <laughs> now I have people talking about the Ming Dynasty, one ounce <laughs> gold bars versus other. Uh, we have people talking about Wayne Gretzky. We have we've traversed quite the uh, path here, guys. Women. Uh, there's, I like there's women. somebody. Yeah, yeah, he likes Mike likes women. Uh, we got that that covered. Uh, gold <laughs> again, gold. Uh, oh, does does Mr. Holland actually use hedge eye? Yeah, of course. Are you kidding? I have a son who works here. <laughs> this is are you, how how many places do what hedge eye does? This is impossible to avoid. Yeah, who, you. who would you consider your best competitor? Uh, independent research providers, but they would be not a team. They right. would be, in some cases, they'd be single, single shot experts. Like you'd have a, a great biotech analyst. You just here. said there is no competitor. Well, and there is no competitor. No one else does what Hedge Eye does. Mm -hmm. No, this is not a commercial. I'm just identifying. These are facts. There's no one out there who do does what you do. And if you look at the record over the last ten years, facts are stubborn things. You've identified a bull market when other people are saying the crap is about to hit the fan. Um, and then you identified when it was pretty much probably over. And then you identified asset categories. So you have a bunch of people here who work and you take the ego out of it and you just say, here, here's the process, we're gonna get this. So this not, a, not a commercial, I'm, I'm observing what's going on. Well, thank you. So how would I ignore that? I, I, mean, I, I yeah. appreciate that. What's a fact? I mean, it's uh, you're not doing it with, I mean. I, and I'm I, not blowing smoke, no, there's, there's no I, I reason. This, this, is, this is what you guys do. Yeah. And so it's a great question. Did you, your wife sent that in? No, she did not, she did not. There, uh, it was actually Bill, uh, so thank you, Bill, for, uh, <laughs> Teeing Mike up for me there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, I used to watch. Oh, and by the by the way, I wouldn't I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe what I just said. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Oh, um, I realize market moves up and down every day for a lot of reasons, but why are the gap earnings that you used to, or that we all used to care about no longer relevant? No longer relevant. I I have trouble with the question actually. I, yeah. Yeah, I think. You know, Probably the, thinking of companies like MLPs or whoever's. Yeah, not, I think I think they're still they're still they're still important. I mean, there, there are a lot of other things to look at at yeah. the same time. I am really a huge fan. Talk about investing in China. People used to say, with some uh, credulity, that uh, forget what the Chinese tell you the GDP is. They say it's growing at seven percent. Nobody nobody knows. It could be three percent. It could be ten percent. Um, but the fact is that we, we were over there investing in companies, so we knew at, at least the top line, we knew how much they sold. Yeah. We, we would visit the factories and we would look at the things they sold, and we'd see them go. And so we had a pretty good sense with a lot of them. What the, and so when you get cash and you get, get reasonable accounting standards, gap still is important. It's not the most important because there are a lot of other things going on mm -hmm. in the markets today, but it's still important. I think some people, they just, you know, it's, it's almost this defeatist, like the, yeah. the, the, the question is, it implies this defeatist comment yeah, that some yeah, people yeah, think. Yeah. It's like, oh, no matter what I think politically or what I want to see happen politically or um, I want to see the market go down, it just can't happen. Right. All you got to do is buy stocks. The right. Fed is just going to save everything. So people have almost a defeatist attitude. And money managers, too. As you know, hedge sure. fund manager returns have not been pretty for the mm, last decade. Ugly business. And a lot of people say, hey, that's not due to my own inability to evolve. That's because the game is rigged. <laughs> Right, you hear that. I hear that. I've heard that so many times over the decades. Right, 
And that's a, kind of a sad thing, really. Yeah. I mean, if we don't evolve, I mean, you're not here for 50 years right. in the business, and I'm certainly not here for 20. Right. Right. Uh, we can't just hide under a rock. If the game seems to be rigged, figure out how you think it's rigged and then take advantage of it. Bingo. This is exactly how we right. use understanding the machine. Right. You know, uh, when I came from Magnetar Capital, which was spun out of Citadel, I was told specifically how the machine was going to reorient me every day. So I'm like, how about I reorient myself before the machine reorients me? And that's why I believe a lot of right. things that I believe. Yes. And it's, um, you either embrace that change or, um, or you do not. Maybe one or two questions here. One, one, maybe one more. I've got to find a good one. You got a lot of questions here, but there were a lot of comments about a lot of things. Um, what, what's the nastiest one? <laughs> Oh, uh, here's one. Um, can you explain why, one more on China, I think, you, again, your experience in China is, is second to, to very few. Um, and the question is, can you explain why Chinese peasants are doing everything they can to move their capital upstream, um, you know, relative, you know, to, 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 into real estate, you know, in Vancouver or in Australia? Yeah. Why are these people, as they move, you know, up that per capita income cons or, or consumption curve, like, why are they trying to move their capital upstream? Out of, out of China. Yeah. Freedom. Freedom. One word. Yeah, Occam's Razor uh, operative here. Um, they have um, wonderful opportunities to move into the middle class, which they never had before. When mm -hmm. I first started going over there, there was no middle class. And there were a few plutocrats who, who had a lot of money, but very few people, even at the top, had a lot of money. They, over the last 25 years, have transformed the economy, got a huge middle class now, uh, a few hundred million. And a lot of but the, the, the really wealthy people started buying in Vancouver when I first started going over there. They Long were already yeah. doing that. Yeah, I mean, it's so, and finally people on Wall Street realized it was a real estate bubble like last year. Yes. But there's a reason why they call it Hancouver. I mean, <laughs> it's not like, um, right. you know. But, so, the, the, but the lack of freedom, there's no question that, that the lack of freedom is, is particularly for the millennials and, and the younger who have grown up with a lot of things that their parents and their grandparents didn't understand. They understand that if they, if they go to Yale, if they, if they go to Vancouver, things are, things are going to be interestingly different for them and probably better. Mm -hmm. And that, that, I can't imagine that that's going to change. No, it's growing. Yeah, if, if anything, it's, it's manifested uh, at a faster and, and, and faster rate. Right. Um, I guess that's why this other question say, say, says, if, 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 if it's so great, then why do all these Chinese billionaires why don't they just flee here? So the billionaires, but that's a different strata you're talking about. You know, people. and that's an interesting question itself because the people I know who are in this group uh, have families there, large families, and they have political connections and military connections. When they look as if they're going, a lot of these people are members of the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. It's one of the ways. The billionaires. To get to be, that's the only yeah, way you would be. You get there. Chinese billionaires. Yeah, right. and to leave and go to Vancouver or New York. Um, there's some other risky things going on hmm. at the same time, so they, they can't do it. They can't. Yeah. Well, that's uh, as insightful as I could keep going and going and going. <laughs> but you see that they're giving me the uh, the orange card there, which is, is the... Danielle says uh, she's here. Yeah, Danielle's here. <laughs> that's who's up next. But again, thank you for, for joining Mike and I in, uh, in what was pretty much a personal discussion by the end of it all, and, and we traversed a lot of different things in markets. I certainly learned a lot. I, I hope you did too.